Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Teaching Kitchen here at New York Presbyterian Hudson Valley Hospital. My name is Emily. I'm delighted that you're joining me here today to learn a little bit about small Japanese bites. Um, I really, I like this class because where it's sort of like, or it's the small bites of, of Japan. Um, I like this class because it's sort of like a tapa style eating, which is really fun because you get to just have lots of little bites of things. And, um, and I find that, you know, if ever you go to a Japanese restaurant, and you don't know what to order, or even you just want to kind of do it yourself at home. Um, this is a good class because it'll help you kind of figure all that out and learn to make some of these things yourself. So uh, before we jump in, I just want to remind everybody to um, put your questions in the chat box. And I sent out the recipes this morning. Uh, so if you didn't get those, I sent them at about, maybe it was 10.30 or so um, with a reminder for this class. And if you didn't get those, I will be sending them again after class. So with the feedback survey. So you will have the recipes for today. I also really like this program because um, it uses very few ingredients. There's really not that many ingredients listed and it's more of a technique-based um, program. So with that, I want to get started um, with our gyoza. So we're going to be using these wonton wrappers. You can find these at Stop and Shop or ShopRite usually has them too. And we're going to be making a shrimp gyoza today. Um, I went ahead and did the first step, which was to shred the cabbage with a little bit of salt so that it's softened and it's releasing some of the liquid. So the next step is pretty straightforward. You can use soy sauce or... I also want to offer this soy-free alternative for people who cannot tolerate soy or who are looking for a low sodium um, variety because in soy sauce, there's a, lot of, um, there's a lot of sodium in soy sauce. So if you're using soy sauce, try to find a low sodium one or use the coconut aminos, which are a little bit sweet, um, but they are also, they have that like salty, savory um, umami flavor that you get from the soy. We're going to be using an ingredient today we haven't used here in the kitchen yet. This is sake. And I want to talk a lot about sake a little bit later to give you the full story of sake and how it's made. Um, but essentially, all you need to know for right this moment is that it's rice wine, wine made from rice. And, um, and then the, the final ingredient in this is a little bit of grated ginger. So it's a very simple one. So here's the cabbage. In goes the soy sauce. In goes the sake. Sake looks a lot like water. It's almost identical. And then we're going to grate in some ginger. So I'm going to go ahead and peel this and I'm going to use a grater to get it really nice and small. So as I'm working on this, Alita, how is everybody doing today? Did anybody have any questions right off the bat? Um, you know, just the questions about the packet, but I think that they found it. Oh, perfect. Okay, very good. All right. And, um, and if anyone wants to share in the chat anything that you've made that's Japanese or Japanese inspired, um, many of you know, or if you don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm a huge, um, I guess, Japan, Japanophile. I love all things Japan and, and Japanese, and um, it's definitely a place that I want to go back to. I went in 2019 for, it was our, our, honeymoon, our honeymoon at the time. And back when we could travel to Japan, and uh, and it just really struck a chord with me. Just this amazing, beautiful culture, this really um, deep reverence for food and craftsmanship, and um, it was very inspiring. So this is sort of where that class is, is inspired by that trip. I'm having a little nostalgia, I guess, because we went uh, we went in the fall. So I've grated some ginger. Peeled and grated. Let's add that into our cabbage mixture. And if you wanted to make these veggie, you could leave out the shrimp, maybe saute up some mushrooms. Um, that would be really good, like some shiitake mushrooms. Or if you wanted to add a protein source, sort of in um, while I'm working on these scallions, um, you could add some, you know, finely diced firm tofu. Just make sure that your tofu isn't too wet. You could, you know, put it in a tofu press or something to get it a little bit drier or just wait it under, you know, on, um, on a surface that's porous so the water can drip through and weight it down. That could be another option as well. Questions, everybody? 
doing okay oh, today yeah. on this beautiful day. Yes, Alina, what do we have? Yes, yeah, so um, Donata says that she's made the steamed dumplings that you showed her how to make before. She says she yeah. froze them separately in a sheet and it worked very well. Oh, fantastic. Um, Thank you, Donata, for letting me know. She says she had to find the wrappers at H Mart, but where in Stop and Shop um, do you find the vegan Yilza? Yeah, the wonton wrappers. wrappers. So I, I did shop from home. And um, I didn't actually, when I put in like wrappers or wonton or whatever in the search bar, I couldn't find them. But when I put in the brands, Nasoya, N-A-S-O-Y-A, in the shop from home um, search bar, then it had all of the things that they sell from Nasoya. And that's when I found the wonton wrappers. So I found them at Shop and Stop um, as well in the section in the back that has a lot of the other vegan items so they okay. have them there as well in the local stop and shop here awesome thank you so and much Alita. you're welcome and there's a question about how long um could you keep a bottle of sake oh that's a good question i actually don't know because i guess it's a it's let's see what does it say on the back here well, I guess the question is, that was a, an insert at the end here. How long um, do you keep an open bottle in the an refrigerator? An open bottle, yeah, in the refrigerator. I'm really not sure. I guess it depends on if you're using it for um, drinking or if you're using it for cooking. Um, yeah, I don't think I know the answer to that. I'm going to mm -hmm. have to look it up. Okay. So um, um, I just want oh, go ahead. You have one so more? Couple of questions about ginger. Do yes. you always need to peel it? Have you ever frozen it? I never see I do, you use yeah, it. I do once you buy peel it. it. I do peel mm -hmm. it because um, the, the peel is a little bit bitter. It doesn't have the same kind of clean ginger taste. Um, you can definitely peel it and then freeze it. And then anytime you need it, just grate it from the freezer. Yeah. We ready for shrimp? Yes. Yes. Okay. So I noticed that there was a price difference um, in the shrimp in the store and the fresh shrimp, the ones that were peeled and the ones that were not. So I bought the ones that were not, and I just want to show you how to peel them because they're a little bit cheaper. So you can pull the, I kind of squeeze the tail and pull off, and then I go underneath where the little legs are, poor little shrimp, and then I kind of take it off like it's, it's wearing a jacket, and that's how I peel it. So I'll do that once more. I pinch right about here, right above the tail, pinch and pull, and that gets rid of a, a large piece of the shell. And then I take off from the leg and peel like it's wearing a jacket. Okay, so that's a good way to save a little bit of money um, is just to, you know, do that, do that step yourself because they're charging you for that labor. All right. So now I'm just gonna chop this up nice and finely. And I think I have about three quarters of a pound of shrimp here. It may have gotten a little bit more than the recipe calls for half a pound. And I'm not gonna make all the dumplings here. I'm just gonna make a few to show you the technique and I'll make the rest later. So you don't sit there watching me, you know, hold dumplings all day. That could be a nice class though, right? Just like mesmerizing, watching the dumpling folding. So I'm really working this shrimp. Really, really working it down. Want it to be nice and small. Of course, if you wanted to take a, a quick uh, detour, you could use your food processor and put everything in the food processor. That works well too. But I do like to demonstrate this by hand because not everyone has a food processor. So if I can do it by hand, I usually, I usually will. So you're gonna mix all this together. This is gonna be the filling. And um, again, I'm using, I'm using this cabbage, but if you wanted to use different veggies, um, you know, go ahead, use, uh, use whatever kind of veggies you think would be good. I think grated carrot could work really well. Saute, if you're using mushrooms, I would cook them a bit first, uh, just so they release some of their liquid because mushrooms can be very watery once they're being heated. So mushrooms is a nice option. Bean sprouts is yummy. What else have I used in dumplings? Red pepper, like some peppers, finely diced peppers. But this is sort of the simplest formation. And then you can, you know, make, a, make your own little kind of iteration of it. So this is the basic recipe. All right. So let me show you this filling. 
rinsing my hands a bit, even though I'm going to get them full of filling again. There it is. And um, if you have a tablespoon, sometimes that's useful. I think I have one here, just to kind of make sure that you don't overfill. Um, sometimes I do less than a tablespoon. I just do like a teaspoon. <laughs> so at this point, you've got your little wonton wrappers. Here they are. And you can put a little bit in your, put it in your palm. Take it, oops, take a scoop, dump it on the floor, <laughs> and then take another scoop. <laughs> I guess that one went to the dumpling, uh, the, the dumpling overlords. Okay, a little bit less than a tablespoon, I think is gonna be my size. So you wanna pinch it at the top. And if you look on the back of this, actually, there are some nice instructions. You just kind of pinch it and use some water to seal it on the sides. So you do wanna seal this pretty well and don't overstuff. I always make error. I think I made it again here of overstuffing. Okay, because this is going to go in a pot of boiling water, so we want it to be in good shape. So now I've kind of gone around the top, um, and then the bottom, you can keep going, sealing that with the, the water. So this is dumpling fold, simply, very, very simple dumpling fold number one. This is like dumpling fold for, for um, the beginning stage, beginning stages. <laughs> All right, I think this one's a little over full, but we'll see how it does. So that's one option. And if you look on this second or third page, I think this third page, um, you can play around with different kinds of folds. So I like, um, I, I like the simple one because simplicity for me is always, uh, you know, what I try to go for is simple and delicious. So in it goes, but you can play around with different folds too if you wanted to. I like also, you can take your, you know, put your, put your little dumpling down, go around the edge and do, um, this one's really cute too, the four corners together. You kind of go up one, two, three, four, and pinch them to form like a little, I don't know what this, what you would call this. It looks like, it's like a little box and seal it really well. So that's another fold that you could do, right? So pinching the four corners together, in the middle. My little dumplings are, I think, because I took out my wonton wrappers a little early because <laughs> I was eager to get started. Um, they might be a little dry, but just a little bit of filling. Okay, don't overdo it. That's always the tricky part. Down on the counter and you can go around. And it's really fun to make your own dumplings because I feel like you know, if you do dumplings takeout, which is really nice too, but if you do dumplings takeout, they're often too salty. Um, they're also often not as yummy as when you make them yourself. Um, so I don't know. I find that if you, if you have the patience and you're looking for like a fun project where you can just kind of sit, enjoy, and do stuff in the kitchen for a little while, dumplings is a really nice one. It's also really, um, it's really hands-on. You know, you can see here, you have to focus and concentrate on each one. And I feel like when you do that, it's just, it does something to your brain. It's just a little too much. It does something to your brain where like you're just kind of with it. You know, you're with what you're doing. You can't really pay attention to much else because you're making dumplings. That's important. <laughs> All right, this one might be a little too full. I have a tendency, it seems like. Questions or comments? How is everyone doing? Has anybody made dumplings before? You wanna tell us what you put in them? Feel free. So Donata says that you can drink sake one week after opening. Um, okay. It, ox it oxidizes, but more slowly than wine. Um, oh, she keeps okay. open wine in the fridge and it lasts a bit longer, unopened two years if kept cold. Wow, um, thank you. That is great information. Anything else? No, not for now. Okay, everyone's just mesmerized by the dumplings, right? I'm telling you, it's like you really have to be present. Each one has to be, you know, nicely sealed in these little packages. So I think one of the things that I loved so much about, about, spending some time in Japan was this, that it didn't feel like anything was really ever 
rushed. You know, here you might go to a restaurant and they might already clear your plates away before you've even started. But there's just a really nice kind of pace and respect for, for these kinds of processes. I think it's, it's pretty cool. Okay. So that was about, let's see, I've done one, two, three, four, five, six dumplings. And um, a good cheat also with these dumplings is with this, um, with the dumpling filling. If you're like, okay, I've made 10 dumplings, I'm done. <laughs> and you still have filling, throw it on a walk and, you know, let it, let it stir fry a bit. And you'll have a really nice, oh no, this one cracked. Um, you'll have a really nice kind of like little, little stir fry recipe. I'm going to see, pinch it, trying to pinch it and patch it together. My hands are not nearly as expert as most dumpling masters, but I have fun doing it. So I'm going to fold this one like a little, make a little like ravioli package. That's kind of cute too. You can um, take the little wings and fold them behind. Yeah, I like that. It looks like a little envelope. Who knows if they'll stay, right? But let's see, see what happens. All right, so we're almost ready to move on to the next recipe. I told you you weren't going to want we make dumplings all day, but it turns out you are. Um, <laughs> we're going to go ahead and get started on the next recipe. I promise. I've got some water boiling here. These are going to go in and, uh, and then when they're, they kind of sink to the bottom and then when they float to the top, that's when they're done. So let's wish them luck as they go on their voyage, their journey. And um, I'm going to lift up our dumpling mixture from the floor so I don't accidentally take a spill on it. Okay, shrimp can be slippery. So let's turn this up a bit, get this really at a boil. Perfect. And we'll put these in. Shoop. So they're gonna, like I said, they're sinking to the bottom. Try to space them out. You don't want to over saturate your pot. It's funny, they all kind of like gravitate towards each other. As soon as I put one in, it like swam over to the others. Really funny. Questions about that recipe? You all feel good about making your little gyoza? There's a comment from Josephine. She says, in Asian homes, making dumplings is a time for the family to come together. Says her daughter-in-law yeah. is Chinese, and we just had a dumpling making gathering for friends and family. They use pork as a protein. Oh, that's so lovely. Yeah. And I think that's, that's definitely what it's all about, right? Getting people together and, you know, working on this manual task together. It's, um, it's really a great way to, to connect to one another. I feel like, you know how like sometimes you have better conversations when you're in the car together because it's like you're both looking at something else. I don't know. It's something like that, right? Where you have this it's just a different kind of energy, I think. It brings a different, um, yeah, a different way of connecting. All right, this is all shrimpified, so I'm going to flip it over. Um, by the way, I put this in the dishwasher all the time, so you should feel free to do the same. So these are starting to float. Some of them are coming to the surface. So I'm going to get my little slotted spoon, get my plate ready. I've got everything washed up, ready for the next recipe. And um, that's going to be our chicken. So for the chicken, if you're looking, uh, following along, it's the yakitori, chicken skewers. So that's what we're gonna be making next. Again, a very, very simple recipe that only uses a few ingredients. So as soon as they float to the top, they're done. Pretty little packages. And then I included a dipping sauce for these too. If you wanted to um, have a look at that. It's pretty straightforward. There's just, uh, what did I mix in there? I think I did a mix of soy sauce with um, rice vinegar and a little bit of red pepper flakes if you like it spicy. Oh, this one got a little stuck to the bottom. Sometimes you need to just um, release them from the bottom a bit because when they go down, the wrapper gets stuck. But uh, these are done. They just needed to be released. So super simple, right? So you get all the folding done. They look really cute. There they are. Okay, so that's number one, our small bite number one. It really is a little small bite. And these are best eaten fresh. 
Or um, as someone mentioned, you can freeze them, just let them cool down and then, and then you can freeze them from there. Okay, we gotta keep rolling here. So I'm just gonna scoot this over to the side. And make some space. So for this recipe, we're gonna be using the chicken. And um, you know what? Since chicken and shrimp are the same, I'm gonna cross contaminate with the shrimp and the chicken. I you know it's, it's um, not something you will usually see me do, but because I'm gonna flip this over and um, actually, you know what? Maybe I'll get a fresh board when I work with the squash. Let's do that. Okay, I'll get a fresh board when, just to be on the super safe side. All right, so we have these pieces of chicken. They've been marinating in some soy sauce. And um, you want to marinate them for about three hours. Here they are. You don't need a lot of soy sauce, just about one or two teaspoons. And then our next step is going to be cutting them into pieces. So you can use scissors to do this. I often like to grab some scissors and just cut them into smaller chunks. So this is yakitori. This is um, a traditional way of um, making chicken skewers. Um, usually they're not made in the oven. They're made on the, the way that I've seen them made is out on the grill. But um, ooh, this one's a little hard to cut through, but we don't have a grill in here. So we're gonna use our sort of our, our makeshift grill. These are boneless and skinless chicken thighs. You of course can use chicken breast if you want even less um, saturated fat, a little bit leaner. So go ahead and use, you know, whatever slice of chicken works for you. And you may notice something unusual about my skewers here. They are, it's like they're, <laughs> They've got little tinfoil hats on. They're waiting for, uh, for the alien um, <laughs> invasion. They've got little tin hats on. So the, the tinfoil serves a purpose. Because I'm gonna be broiling these, they're gonna go almost you know, very close to a flame. Um, the tinfoil helps to make sure that the chicken and stays you know, nice and close, but that the bamboo skewer doesn't get that extra special uh, char or should I say uh, flame. So you want to go ahead and push the skewer through. And then I have here, I have this ready. This is just a uh, sheet pan. You'll notice I put a cookie sheet in here. You don't have to do that, but you can. Um, so once I push the skewer through it, I cut off any excess skewer. So that way I'm, I'm sure that it's the right kind of shape and size. Questions or comments? Yes, there are two. So um, Donata says that your dumpling making process is like making ravioli. Yeah, you're right. It is Donata. <laughs> that and would be Corinne, a fun class too. Mm -hmm. Corinne says for the chicken thighs, do you need to trim off the white yellow stuff? She's not sure if it's fat or ligaments or tendons. Great question. So them. like you're talking about this stuff right here? Yep. Yeah. So that is, it's usually, um, it's just fat, it's chicken fat. So it's not gonna harm you, you can leave it on. Uh, but of course, if you're watching your saturated fat, you, you might want to get rid of that piece. Yeah, get rid of like trim off and clean it up a little bit. All right, so you can sort of see, this is the process for this. And, um, and the skewers, the other thing I should mention, have been soaked. And um, that's also important to making sure that they stay, you know, well, well hydrated when they are, <laughs> when they're going to be exposed to that flame. I think this one I can fit a few more on. This is another, maybe speed things along a little bit. So instead of having a small little bite like I did for the other three, you can have a kind of three for. So let's get the top there. I also like to snip the top of them because then it's not so sharp and pointy. Um, sometimes, you know, if you're eating off a skewer, you may unintentionally um, spork your mouth, and that's, that's never a good experience, right? So you can see here, I'm kind of laying the chicken down and finding my way through it with the skewer. Maybe we'll fit a few more. And of course, you can always skewer different foods if you wanted to do, um, you know, I don't know how tofu would work with this, but I think it could be interesting if you wanted to broil tofu or um, tempeh. I never really broil tempeh because it just gets too tough. And then it's like, whoa, that's, yeah, it's a little, um, 
a little unpalatable. Tempeh needs a gentler treatment. So, okay. So one thing I wanted to mention is um, the reason I, I love Japan and Japanese food. It's one of the most, well, it's one of the most popular cuisines in the world. And for really good reason, I think. Um, one of the things that I have found in my, in my research on Japan is this rule of fives, which I think is really interesting. It's the idea that um, it's a, tra a traditional Japanese cooking emphasizes this rule of fives. So it emphasizes variety and balance, variety and balance. And I think those are really the name of the game. Um, so what does that actually look like in practice? That means five different cooking, uh, five different colors are emphasized in every meal. You're always going to find something black, white, red, yellow, and green. Those are the five colors. And then there's five different cooking techniques. So there's the raw food. There's, um, what do I have here? Grilling, steaming, uh, boiling, and frying. Yes, so those are the different cooking techniques. And often in a meal, you'll get a, the variety of colors and you'll also get the variety of cooking techniques. So today we are doing the grilling with the chicken. We're doing the, what else are we doing? We're not doing the frying because we're gonna stay away from um, too much fried stuff here in the teaching kitchen. Uh, and then of course we're doing the, well, the boiling, we did the dumplings. And I guess the last recipe is braising, which is kind of like, part pan frying and part steaming. <laughs> That's kind of how braising, braising is. Good. All right, we're almost ready to put these in. I'm just trying to make a little space for each one so it has some, some space to move around. You can put these directly on the sheet pan. You don't have to put it on a, uh, on a you know, I have this, this kind of cookie sheet down in, set in the sheet pan. I just do that because it's a little bit easier to clean the sheet pan later but you don't have to do that. It's also a good technique because it kind of helps the air circulate underneath. So kind of fun, a fun technique to know about. All right, so let's clean off our chicken land, chicken land, <laughs> let's just call it that, chicken land. I'm gonna wash my hands with some soap back here so we can get ready for the next recipe. So any questions while I'm washing my hands here? I know sometimes it's hard to hear me when the water is running. Not at this moment, Chef Emily. Okay, let's see. I had another thing. Ah, here it is. All right, so in goes the chicken. The broiler is on, it's ready to go. If you wanted to add a little bit of oil, you could you know, do a little squiggle, but you don't really need to because the chicken thighs already have um, some good fat on them. So just be careful using that broiler. It's gonna get, it's gonna get like a dark charred kind of um, semi-burned <laughs> appearance, but, uh, but that's, that's somewhat normal for this recipe. Okay, I think I have another cutting board. I just wanna go and grab that. See if I can find wherever I left it. Okay, there it is. So our final two recipes, one's gonna be squash, and one's gonna be edamame. This is the biggest cutting board in the world, but it will be good at covering our space here. All right, so our next recipe is squash and edamame. So we're gonna be using kabocha squash. Let's get started with that one first, because that takes a little bit more time. So it's pretty straightforward. This is our beautiful kabocha. This is what it looks like. And you're just gonna start off by heating your pan. You're gonna need a pan with a lid for this one. So I'm just gonna turn this on so it'll start to warm up a bit while I get the squash ready. And um, kabochas are completely edible, all parts. So try, don't cut through the stem because it's really hard to, to get through that part. Um, but so what I usually do is I get it started a little bit and I kind of score it all the way around if I can. A little bit hard to manage, but you can eventually kind of store, score it. So you can see here, I've made like a, a line all the way. And then I kind of go in with the point and, and chop down. 
And of course, if you wanted to, you know, um, microwave your squash or do any of those tricks to get it softer, but usually it's just about like wet, getting a wedge in there. Look at that color. So beautiful. I mean, it's like eating the sun. So pretty. Okay. And um, squash has, does a funny thing to my hands. I don't know if any of you have noticed this as well, but when I'm working with like zucchini or kabocha squash or anything like that, it's, it kind of like stays on my hands, even if I wash them. So if you want to wear gloves, you can feel free to do so. So now we're going to go in and scoop the seeds. I bet you could eat these seeds. Has anyone tried that? Has anybody tried roasting kabocha squash seeds? I do it with delicata all the time, but I bet your kabocha would work well. If anybody wants to um, share their seed roasting experiences, especially now that pumpkins are upon us, please feel free. Best roasted seed ideas, etc. Best seed practices. All right, so I'm really scooping out. This is like a cave in here. Scooping out all the seeds. And then we're going to get this into the pan with a little bit of oil and brown it on both sides. Anything coming in from our, from our group today, Alita? No, they're just watching you cook. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right, everybody. Well, thanks for being here. That's what counts. All right, so now you've got these, these um, kabocha pieces. You're going to go ahead and make slices. So I like to work on the flat surface of the squash and just make these little moons look really pretty. I like to make them, you know, about half an inch thick um, just to expedite the cooking. You could certainly go thicker. It just might take a little bit more time, and you might need to add more liquid to, be, to um, compensate for that time on the heat. All right, let's get these into the pan. Put this off to the side. I'll show you how to handle that stem. So I'm using a little avocado oil. Better at high heats. Move this around. And then each one is going to get its own spot on the pan. I, I like to kind of like nest them in next to each other if you can. So we're starting with the browning, and then we'll move to the braising, the, the kind of getting that brown, nice brown flavor. See if I can squeeze all these in. Ooh, scattering a little bit. Okay. Careful as you do this, because the squash, this one will go in the next round. The squash um, is has that liquid on, around it, so when it's exposed to the oil, it's going to like do, 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 be a little chatty. All right, then, um, okay, where am I? Hi. So <laughs> we are combining a little bit of miso with half of our sake. So you do want to kind of break this down a little bit. It takes a, a bit of patience, but you just kind of work it down little by little. Um, if you were in Japan, you would probably use chopsticks to stir this up. That's the way to do it. And um, we add this, the kabocha to the skillet. We're going to brown it on both sides. We're gonna add the sake, the remaining sake. So there's a whole cup of sake in this recipe. We're gonna add half a cup once it's brown on both sides and um, a little bit of red pepper flakes for some fun flavor. And then that's it, you're, just, you're done with this recipe. So, okay, I wanted to talk a bit about sake because I think it's a really interesting topic. I don't know if anyone out there is a sake aficionado or appreciator or, or um, curious, sake curious. Uh, but sake literally translates to alcohol in Japan. So if you translate the word sake, it just means alcohol. Uh, what we think of as sake is actually called Nihon Shu, and that's N-I-H-O-N-S-H-U. So if you were in Japan and you wanted to, you know, grab a drink with your colleagues, you would say, hey, let's go grab some sake. It just means let's go get some alcohol. But the, the, what we think of as sake here in the West is called Nihon Shu. So sake season starts in October, interestingly enough, here we are, when the weather gets colder. Um, this really makes for more flavorful brewing, uh, favorful and flavorful, I guess, brewing conditions. And, um, and what's a big difference between wine and sake is that sake is fermented for one to two months, and then it's enjoyed. So it's not aged like wine. Um, it's made from a special kind of sake rice, uh, of which there are many, many varieties. 
The other ingredients are koji, which is a, a type of mold spore. And then the final ingredient is uh, usually water. And um, it's interesting, there's different kinds of waters throughout the region in, in Japan. So there's many different kinds of rice, there's many different kinds of water, and that makes for very different flavors. So um, other things that make for different flavors and the process is sometimes alcohol is added too. Um, so something that the process of making sake, if you're all interested in embarking on this, <laughs> this little um, sake geek out voyage with me, uh, the rice is first polished and how much it's polished actually contributes to the flavor. So if it's less polished, then it's kind of funkier and a little less pure and not as a, a clean taste. Um, the rice is then, so that's the polishing part and that contributes a lot to the flavor. Then the wash, it, the rice is washed and soaked overnight and then it's steamed. After steaming that's when the mold spore is added so it's kind of spread out and cooled down so that it doesn't kill the mold spore the koji and the the koji is added to it yeast is sometimes add, added as well once those are added the rice is kind of bundled up in this big bundle so it's a given time to ferment uh, and that usually takes about let me see if i can find this i think i wrote it in my notes somewhere how long that takes bundled and then I didn't write down how long it takes, but after the bacteria feeds on the rice, then it's transferred to these big vats and the liquid is, is um, added so that it ferments even more. Um, oh, I did write it down. Okay, two weeks. So usually the ferment lasts about two weeks and then the mixture is pressed to, to reveal the sake. So at that point, it's filtered or unfiltered and it looks different depending on, on the processing but it's filtered to be more kind of clean and pure taste. Um, and then that can be further filtered through charcoal. That's usually a very expensive sake for more like premium product. So that's the whole process of making sake. There's a byproduct, right? Of all that, that fermented rice that's called sake kasu. Um, and it's a lot like miso. It can be used in cooking. Does anyone have any questions about all that sake information? Um, not about sake, but Donata had commented that she has roasted pumpkin seeds in her classroom just to show the kids where they come from. Oh, cool. Thanks, Donata. Mm -hmm. All right. So I'm just flipping the squash over. It's got a little bit of browning happening. Not a lot, just a little bit. Giving it that nice, nice flavor. Make sure every piece goes on both sides. Um, and then... We're going to add the sake. So once it's got a little browning on both sides, we'll add the sake. Okay, there's one more dish we're going to make, and this is a super quick and easy one. And it's the boiled edamame. So let's do that here. I have a pot of water that's already hot. And, um, and this one's super simple. If I can find where I put my edamame, it's very simple. Okay, so this is whole edamame. You can find these in the frozen section. And um, edamame is a fantastic source of protein. So edamame beans are whole, immature soybeans. They're green, as you can see here. They're high in protein. So uh, 20 grams of protein for one cup. Yep, that's right. And um, what else did I want to say about edamame? Oh, they're the only, uh, they're one of the only legumes that's a whole protein source. So you're actually absorbing all of the protein that's in this as opposed to like black beans, they don't have the complete amino acid profile to be considered a whole protein. So the body doesn't absorb, it might say 10 grams of protein on a black bean chili, but your body's not gonna absorb all of it unless it's paired with usually like a rice or something like that, that has the complementary amino acid uh, building block. And then that, that creates a whole protein if you have them together. But edamame is a whole protein. It's low in carbohydrates, really high in folate. It also contains um, vitamin K, iron, and thiamine. So let's put them in our boiling water. And this one's really easy because you just let it cook. That's it. Okay, so we're ready for our next steps here. Let's add the sake. Here are the red pepper flakes. A little dash of those, a dash of the sake, and cover it right away. So you put this Back in half of it and then you cover it. We've got the miso and sake here for the end of that. And I will work on the rest of this pumpkin later. Questions about everybody's doing okay? 
Let me get a strainer for the edamame because that's going to be useful. Yeah, there's a couple of comments. Um, Zanata says that based on your explanation, she can now um, see why sake should be freshly drunk. <laughs> so it yes, makes sense. exactly. Yeah, yeah, right. So, so it's very different from wine. Exactly. And then right. Patricia, how's that chicken doing? Oh my gosh, that looks so good. Go ahead. And then Patricia commented that whenever she had sake, and she said this was years ago, it was always served warm. But now she understands people drink it cold. Um, yeah. Know anything regarding the serving temperatures? Yeah. So Patricia, you're right. So um, the serving temperatures. I just want you to appreciate how beautiful this is. Oh my gosh, it's like I'm gonna. I, I, I don't even like chicken that much, but this is amazing. <laughs> it smells so good. Um, and it's like really nicely brown. We're gonna flip it over and brown the other side. So sake temperature, yes. Um, it can be served warm or cold. It depends on your preference. And different bottles will actually sometimes say on the side, like it'll suggest uh, the, the correct temperature to serve it at. Cause you're right, it really can, can vary. But I did, um, when I did this, this sake tasting in Japan, which is where I really learned so much of this information, um, the sake, we had the same sake served warm and cold, and it was almost like a completely different experience. <clears throat> Excuse me, different experience. So uh, let's see what this one says though. Let's see here. Okay, serving temperature. It says chill, if you want it, chill. okay, all of them. So it says, if you want it chilled, it gives you the temperature for that, room temp, warm, or hot. It gives you the temperature for each. And here it says, let's see, it gives you a little scale here. On the scale of sweet to dry, this one's closer to the dry. On full body to light body, this one's closer to the full bodied. So it's cool. This one has like a little key. I don't know if you guys can see that very well. So um, some sake bottles will have uh, instructions for people like me who don't really know how to enjoy their sake. Um, but uh, yeah, Patricia, I hope that answers your question. All right, we're winding down here. So this has now absorbed a lot of that wonderful sake flavor. The pan is almost dry. Let me show you. See, we put the sake in and we braised it. This, the um, squash gets really tender that way or the pumpkin gets really tender. Now I'm gonna take it, turn the heat off. We'll add the rest of the sake and miso mixture. And you're done. Kind of a fun preparation of kabocha squash. I really like it. So you can kind of put that around the can a little bit. It smells really good. Okay, final questions and comments. We're just out of time. So we'll just wrap up. Want to make sure we got to everything. Yeah, no questions so far. Okay, very good. So the edamame should cook for, let me see. Do I see the package? Do I see the package? Here it is. Uh, I usually do about five minutes or so. Yeah, five to seven minutes. There you go, five to seven minutes. This is like the easiest, easiest Japanese small bite you could possibly have, right? Just um, cooking those edamame for five to seven minutes. All right, so let's plate up our squash. I did, uh, I know this, this topic is small Japanese bites, but I thought it would be fun to serve them on a giant plate. <laughs> small bite, big plate. <laughs> that would be a really good name of a, of a restaurant or something. You heard it here first. Small bites, big plate. Okay. Ooh, you want to be careful with these because they will be a bit delicate. So try not to break them as, they're, as you're scooping them out. You can also, um, here's the squash. You can also use a spatula to kind of zoop, scoop them out that way too. All right, edamame is next. And edamame, woo! I'm really into spilling things on the floor today. <laughs> edamame is, um, is really nice too because, um, you know, not only is it the complete protein and all the nutritional benefits I mentioned, it's really fun to eat. <laughs> you know, you kind of, you grab the end of it and these are really hot. You grab the end of it and you kind of pop out, woo! pop out the little seeds, and that's the part that you eat. You don't eat the, the whole outside, okay? Um, I like to, as soon as these, you know, come out, I like to hit them with a little jet of cold, a little stream of cold water to cool them down a bit. And then you pop them on your plate. 
you add a dash of salt. If you have like a nice salt, you know, it's a good opportunity to use that because the salt really shines on these. And then as you're eating them, you kind of bite and pull and, you know, the, the, the edamame pops into your mouth and you have a little saltiness and it's really, it's really good. All right, everybody, that is our class for today. I need to get a mop around here. My goodness. <laughs> Let's check on our, our uh, yakitori. They must be done. Oh, yeah. Okay, so how easy, right? There they are. They look really, really good. I'll pop a few down here on the plate. Um, another advantage of having the tin foil around the ends is that it doesn't get as hot somehow. I think tin foil, like you know, is uh, very good at regulating its temperature. So there you have it. All right, everybody. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you for joining me today on our little. Uh, trip to <laughs> virtual trip to Japan. I, I have to say I've not done nearly as well as as any Japanese chef out there. Uh, just doing the best that I can and and um, sharing all of the inspiration that I've gotten from that beautiful beautiful culture and been lucky enough to experience to to a hair of an extent. There is so much more. There is so much more, and this is just just the surface and the beginning of it. So thank you, everybody. I hope you enjoy. I hope you try these out. Um, add a little something different to your plate. Get some variety. Enjoy the seasonal squash. And Alita, thank you as always uh, for moderating. Any my, my pleasure. questions? No, just lots, just lots of okay. thanks. And that it looks beautiful, oh, looks yummy. And they can't you. wait to make their own. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, everybody. And you can see this was very effective at not charring the, um, I don't know if you can see, I just want to show you, see where the tinfoil was and where it wasn't, right? What a difference. So it takes a little bit of time to wrap each one. It's not that much time. I usually just uh, grab like a little piece of tinfoil. I guess I can show you how I do it quickly. And, um, and I wrap around the end. One, two, that's good. And then I tear it and then you're done. That's one. So it's pretty quick to, quick uh, process to do. All right, everybody. Thank you again. Hope to see you. Let's see. Tomorrow we have another class. Um, it's a bariatric supportive cooking class related to side effects of treatment. We're going to be focusing on reflux and GERD. So if anyone, even if you haven't had bariatric surgery, if you are interested in that topic, uh, feel free to join us for that. And then on Thursday, we have plant-based fall dishes. So we'll be doing more, uh, more cooking and there's more coming up next week. See you soon. Bye.